Um, Nathan Martin has qualified for the U.S. Olympic Trials. <laughs> this Saturday is sweetest day, and if you support the men's golf team by buying some stuff for the person you think is the sweetest. And then there are no spots left for Talents for Christ Chapel, so don't even try. If you have any prayer requests or anything you need to pray for this morning, there's going to be a group right over here who's willing to do that. And last but not least, we have some senior expedition guests. Let's give them a round of applause. Well, good morning. Just by way of reminder as to why we're here, would you join with me in, in the call to chapel? We gather together in the name of Jesus Christ to worship him to hear his word spoken as he seeks to conform us to his image, to write his word on the tablet of our hearts, and to transform us by the renewing of our minds for his glory. Amen. I'd like to introduce, have our speaker introduced. Dr. Pan, would you come down here and stand? And could I have all those who are introducing Dr. Patton come down? Make room for Amanda to come up. She's going to introduce Paul. And could I have the rest of the chapel stand, gather down front for worship and for prayer, gather in around Dr. Patton as we lift him before the Lord. Good luck getting close to him. You may not know this, but about 25 of his seniors who were just on retreat with him this past weekend are gathered in around him to pray for him as well. So uh, as we usually do, let's lift up our voices in prayer. And then after a bit, Amanda will lead us. Go ahead and lift your voices in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, Lord. Thank you so much for Dr. Patton and all he has done for this campus, for his love of students. I pray that you be with him, calm his nerves, give him the words to speak and give us the hearts to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Wait, 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 wait. It's okay. What's up? It's okay? Just a second. Okay, so as those of you who don't know, um, we just prayed for him, but our speaker this morning is Dr. Patton. He is a director, a playwright, an author, a co-chair of the, the comm department, and he is a professor that has impacted his students on a profound level. So if you ask any one of his students, they'll be able to tell you that he's an amazing man who cares about his students and loves them so passionately, and he just pushes them to go deeper. I remember my freshman year, I was listening to Dr. Patton speak to future teachers, and he said something that I will never forget. He said, be generous with authentic praise. That is one of my favorite expressions, and it is something that has changed the way that I approach people, and I know I'm not the only one. I'm sure if you ask any of the other comm department seniors who are just up here with me, they'll be able to tell you another quotable nugget of wisdom that he has just instilled in their life and something that has impacted their thinking and changed the way that they view people and the way that they view life. So thank you for praying with me, and we'll just worship the Lord together, and welcome Dr. Patton.
stood before creation. And you stood before creation. Eternity in your hands. And you spoke the earth into motion. My soul now. before my failure and carry the cross for my shame I sin away upon your shoulders my soul now to stay so what can I say so what can I say What can I do? But offer this all, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation. To declare your promise, my soul now stay. So what can I say? So what can I say? And what can I do? And offer this all. What can I say? 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for this Monday morning, God. Thank you that all of us could be here um, and gather together in your name. You and Dr. Patton, as he speaks to us, give him the words that we need to hear this morning. I love you so much. In your name we pray. I want you to uh, take note of my, ca uh, my, my, my journal. It has Jesus on the cover. So that means, pardon me, it's a Christian journal. <laughs> Every time I try to sing in chapel, I start to cry. You know, it's just overwhelming. So oftentimes I'll sit in the balcony or sit in the back because it's just too intense up here. And by the way, uh, you might be depressed this morning and you heard them say, I got the joy, I got the joy, I got the joy. Please understand that you are part of a Christian tradition and faith. Both the Old and New Testaments are very clear that even as the prophets communicated in the midst of their depression, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, called upon the joy of the Lord to inform them. The Apostle Paul, who said of his evangelistic entourage, we are sorrowful but rejoicing. We are sorrowful but rejoicing. That's a paradox. And our brother in Christ, G.K. Chesterton, said that paradox is the truth standing on its head for attention. That's you. Both of those things can be true. Both of those things can be true. Now, thanks to Clay and Autumn and those dear folks up there for helping me out. But whenever, Ron, I'm invited to do this in October, I'm always tempted. <laughs> and Oscar Wilde said, I can resist anything but temptation, right? I always love to tell Bible horror stories in October. Uh, why? Before we get kicking, the ability Spring Arbor community to be horrified is a common grace. Do you understand that? Given to humans. Given from the Lord our God, whether we recognize him or not. But for what purpose? It is an instrument of warning, a call to repentance. It is not a recreational sport, indicative of capitalistic propensity to exploit all potential escapes from boredom. I'm bored, let's turn the channel so I can be purposefully horrified. That's recreational. The effects of push-button accessibility to whore can deaden our senses, can dull our sensitivity. It simply takes more and more and more to horrify us. And that's the real horror. This is the effects of overexposure, remembering that Christian wisdom is in moderation. But I am telling you that the Bible has enough horrors in it to keep you on your toes. And I got more than a couple of volumes of Bible horror stories. I'm going to do volume one this morning. The first uh, earlier emanation came when you were second, third, or fourth graders. I did this in chapel in 2003. But it's also an exercise in what is called theatrical hermeneutics. What are hermeneutics? The science of interpretation. Any text. But there is such a thing as theatrical hermeneutics where you see it performed, you see a film of it shot, you hear it dramatically read, and there's something that you see and sense and feel and take away 
in contrast to reading it devotionally. And again, we should be reading the scriptures devotionally. You need a program related to the calendar date of the month. Start with Luke and Acts. Today is the 13th of Luke, of, of, of Luke, of October. So you're reading, even if you don't feel like it, just to develop a habit of the heart. Luke 13, and then Acts 13. And if you forget about it tomorrow, don't pick up where you left off. Go to today's manna. Yes, devotional reading is great, but it's secondary. It's oftentimes random. This is a reading program that is not random. And what happens after one year of reading Luke and Acts 10 times minimally? Because you're reading it one chapter a day, I am telling you. You can't wait till tomorrow. Because that text, that chapter, as you learn more about being able to draw something special from each chapter, and it happens as you read it systematically and repeatedly. These are disciplines, whether you're an agnostic or an atheist or a Christian, whatever your religious system, it is an important thing for you to know the gospel story and the, the acts of the apostles. Related again to the chapter uh, to the calendar date. Theatrical hermeneutics. This is in contrast to even devotional reading where we do it out of obligation. And of course there are obligations in our Christian faith. There are obligations in any relationship. There's an obligation to keep the norms of the relationship, to keep the promises. There's an obligation to commit yourself to cultivating trustworthiness kindness and grace and all of those eternal, eternal values, right? But I want you to get in the habit, not just because some filmmaker has graciously prompted you to think imaginatively, but start, particularly when you're reading biblical narratives, start using your imagination. Hear the voices, imagine the scenes, Imagine the thrills and the horrors beyond Harry Potter. To give you an example of this, I've not met believers who have been able to describe for me what had to have been a potential shock for the Apostle Paul to hear the Ephesians in their Colosseum chanting for two hours, Hail to Artemis, goddess of the Ephesians! You chant anything for ten minutes, you're going to start frothing at the mouth more than I'm doing now. <laughs> Theatrical hermeneutics. It's going to take some energy. It's going to take some courage. But you're going to be able to read about the sons of Sneva. You're going to be able to read about the, the masses in Ephesus. You're going to be able to read about Mars Hill and sense it like you haven't sensed it before. There's also implications of this for people who are committed and assigned to read the Bible in public. Don't think that you're doing it in a sacred style by reading it in monotone. Prepare, understand the context, realize dramatically there are probably a variety of ways to say something in the text faithfully, but you study it. You prayerfully prepare it because you know there's also a possibility of theatrically being unfaithful. For instance, we don't know how Jesus said this Mary when he was a resurrected Savior and Mary didn't recognize him until she heard her name, and it happens to all of us. Did he say, Mary, Mary? You can imagine all of those, but use your imagination. There's a variety of opportunities to express faithfully the drama the passion, sometimes the horrors, as you're going to hear this morning. Now, on to our next slide, if you don't mind. This is the thesis, biblical courage in the face of the horrifying. <sighs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> Trick or treat. Onto the next slide. <laughs> the foundation of biblical courage is that we are confident 
the confident assertion that God is with us, the assurance of the presence of the Lord. In fact, I can only think of one scripture where the admonition, the command to be courageous, Michael, is not accompanied with this reminder that God is with you. And for those of you who are students of Kierkegaard, you understand how important that phrase was to him, one of the most influential voices of the 19th century. And it's one of the most important phrases for us to make sure that we're transcending in our dance with pop culture. Students, you know I had to get it in. <laughs> but note these texts of Scripture. Deuteronomy 31, it's Moses speaking to Joshua, but the writer of Hebrews applies it to all believers. I'm with you always. God is with you always. I know sometimes that seems absurd. It seems like an intellectual scandal, but that's the promise of the Scriptures. It's true or it ain't. Just like any kind of confession, testimony, you got to believe it or not. You might need more evidence. Ask, have the courage to ask. Joshua 1, 7 through 9, anybody named Joshua, that should be your theme verse for your life. Be strong and very courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God is with you. Is with you. That's an assertion that probably should be made every day. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 18. Here we got Solomon dedicating the temple. And he kind of approaches what appears to be the scandal of this all, that the Lord of the universe, the creator of every planet, and of course these ancient people didn't realize how big the universe was. Up until about 100 years ago, probably they thought the universe was the galaxy. Now we realize we've got billions of galaxies. <laughs> and the God who made all of that knows your name. And he promises to be with you wherever you go, right? Here's Solomon saying, okay, we're dedicating the temple. Does really the God of the universe dwell in this house? Trying to get my arm around that, essentially, because your glories have been expanded beyond the skies, and you have made this concession graciously to dwell with us. Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 8, his glory will be your rear guard. And by the way, whenever you hear of the glory of God, please don't confuse it with God himself. The glory of God is the impact of his presence. The impact of his presence will be your rear guard. And by the way, hopefully you're learning to see incrementally over time the impact of God's presence in your life. Clearly, Psalm chapter 33 is saying you're learning to see the loving kindness of God or you're not. Next slide, if possible. And then, of course, that Matthew 28, verse 20, lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Whoop, there he ascends. Wow. Jesus Christ is with us. Even through the disappointments, even through the senior proms, in your, even through the Spring Arbor dances, and oh, by the way, please, son, the responsibility is on your generation. Teach us to dance <laughs> with themes that are transcendent. Christ is with us even in the horrors. What you see here are the three stories through the synoptic gospels of Jesus and his disciples confronting a ghoul. We're not, we're not there yet. Next slide, if possible. We're going to talk about Jesus being with you in the gale, in the gales, the windstorms, the storms of your life. He's with you. Then also the ghoul, the monstrosities that you could become. In fact, by the way, all great monster movies and stories, be it Dracula, I'm putting a little shameless plug for our theatrical production that you'll all be there proving that you love me. Uh, October 23rd, 24th, and 25th, right? And it's uh, like students at six bucks, which means it's about the, about the price of a, a Big Mac meal, a lot less gas. Okay, please, please, please come. I love McDonald's, by the way. The ghoul. Oh, I got to tell you this before we move on. I'm asked to scare fifth graders. 
every year at Warner High. Is anyone, uh, Warner Elementary, anyone uh, remember that? I've got some students that were at Warner when I would tell that, so all I do is read from the script that you're gonna see and turn on the score. And guess what? You scared me, man, is what those 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds say. But why Dracula? Because Dracula is an embodiment of the biblical perspective of the nature of evil. I always like to cast someone, and Trevor Tracy has cast someone who is extremely charming as Dracula. Just wait. The ghoul, the monsters that you could become or those monstrosities around you. Hear it? And then also the gallows. Jesus in Mark 5 is crossing the lake. He goes to sleep on a cushion. I wonder what those 2,000-year-old cushions look like. All right, move over, lazy boy. Jesus gets on a cushion, falls asleep, and this violent storm comes up, and the disciples think they're going to die. Have you ever thought you were going to die? It doesn't count on the roller coaster at Cedar Point. Have you ever thought you were going to die? They thought they were going to die. These grown men, these burly men, these fishermen are screaming, ah, we're going to die, panic-stricken. And so finally they decide to wake up their rabbi. (laughs) Don't you care about us? We're all going to drown, rabbi. (laughs) He gets up. No panic. And we don't know how he says it. Was it like this? Be still! Was it a whisper? Be still. But suddenly something weird happened. And these disciples had Jesus had seen Jesus healing people all evening long. Boom, 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 people healed. They'd seen that. And they said, wow, we're on the inner circle of this revolution and the, the bringing in of the kingdom of God. Boom, boom, but now I'm in the boat and I'm about to drown and he's sleeping. And then I saw him go, be still. And then the text says in uh, Mark 4 that they were terrified, not by the storm, but by what? The manner of man that they were with. Just, I want you to use your imagination, pretend that you're Peter or James or John or Bartholomew, any of those guys. You are peeing your pants. (laughs) I thought I knew this guy. And he goes, boom! And the storm (laughs) stopped. Oh, whoa, why did I sign up for this? Then in Mark 5, it says this. They reach the shore in the region of the Gerasene. Jesus gets out of the boat. Again, you're Peter, you're James, you're Bartholomew, and you see this ghoul, this man who lives in the tomb running over the hills like a Tasmanian devil. And you've heard about him. He's so terrifying and so violent. Anyone, it says in Matthew 8, anyone who came by, he violently murdered. So people just left him alone. But our Savior had a divine appointment with this terrorizer of people who also had a mother and a father, probably had siblings. You talk about the potential of you being a disappointment to mom and dad. How's the kid? Uh, I'd rather not go there. (laughs) Now, to think about the ghoul, you need to realize, to think about this demoniac, the best way to understand him is, again, to think about the ghoul. I think that there's a picture next. See, not that guy. (laughs) That guy. The Incredible Hulk. We understand the Incredible Hawk. And anyone who has wrestled with rage internally and anger that they sometimes get frustrated trying to control, they understand why this character works at this pre-conscious level. But that's how you understand him. And again, the disciples have just been terrorized, just been terrorized by this Savior who said, storm be still, and suddenly they get out and here comes the Hulk. The text says... 
that he was bound oftentimes when they were trying to control him, hand and feet, but he tore the chains in his hands and broke the bonds at his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And Jesus has a divine appointment. And this is what I love about this story, the terror of it, and yet also the reminder of who Jesus is without fear. Jesus says, as his disciples are probably trembling in the background, what did we do? What did we do? Do something. Come out of this man, you evil spirit. What does the ghoul say? As he sees Jesus from afar, he runs to him and falls on his knees before him and screams at the top of his voice. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you will not torture me before the time. My guess it was a hundred times more terrifying than that. We don't know what the voice was, but it was at the top of his voice, and it was stunning. And he's responding to that because Jesus had said, come out of this man. And what's very intriguing for those of you that are beginning a lesson in theatrical hermeneutics, how is it that these spirits were the most exacting in their understanding of who Jesus was, much beyond any of his followers they knew? Why? Because they were terrorizing people and they knew who was the terror, their terror. It was Jesus, the terrorizer of all those that bring terror and evil on others. That's the Savior. And I don't have time to read you some of my musings on one of my favorite characters. But then Jesus asked, what's your name? How did he ask it? What's your name? Look at me. What's your name? You know the answer to that, but you haven't heard it. Legion is my name, for we are many, right? And he kept begging Jesus again and again and again not to send them out of the area before the time. You can imagine what that's. No, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, whatever. And whatever it was, it was a thousand times more terrifying than that. And here again, Peter, uh, uh, uh. Now, there's some people, my my colleagues, I think of Ken Brewer. I think of people like our brother Ron, Dr. Laura, some of these folks. You can imagine that level of courage. And we come to that, even in the struggles within. Legion is my name, for we are many. And you know the story. There was some pigs grazing, 2,000 of them in a field nearby. And the, and the evil spirits were saying, send us among the pigs, send us among the pigs. And Jesus says, okay. Boom. They go in the pigs, you know, they run down the pigs with the spirits in them and go into the lake and are drowned and all the shepherds run off to tell the people. The people in the town and countrysides hear this and they come to find Jesus. And what do they see when they find him? They see the demoniac, the ghoul, who used to talk like this. Now what? Clothed. Where did the clothes come from? Because the Matthew text and the Luke text say that he was naked and he didn't live in a house because he only dwelt and communed with the dead. The living were perhaps too terrifying. My guess is that the layers of clothing that the disciples had on, Jesus said, all right, you got more than enough. Give it to him. And these people who owned these pigs, the, 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 the herds that were gone, and of course, potentially an economic crisis, but listen to this. They saw him, saw him clothed and in his right mind, clinging to the feet of Jesus as you would. And what happened to these people? They were terrified. What were they terrified of? What manner of man is this? What manner of man is this? And then what did they do? They pleaded with him, please leave our region. Leave our region. And I don't have time to tell you why they would have pleaded for Jesus to leave. But Jesus, being the gentleman and our Savior, said, okay, come on, fellas. And the fellas were, oh, oh, thank God we're out of here. They got in the boat. And what did the man 
who was healed do? He probably followed them into the water begging Jesus, can I go with you? I don't know where to go. Jesus says, no, you can't, you, what I want you to do is to go home to your family, that mom, that dad that's been grieved by you. Tell them what the Lord has done for you. And I want you to use your imagination. Don't think he just ran off right away because Jesus said it. <laughs> I'm going back home. <laughs> I can imagine, and filmmakers, use your imagination. We can be helped by some of these being shot. Here he is in the water. Oh, 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 oh. I can imagine him weeping with tears of joy. And he probably watched the boat go until it go, went over the horizon. And then he walked slowly away. What are the gales? What are the ghouls in your life? And what do you need to be reminded? That God is with you through it. And then fast forward quickly. The gallows. A few years later, these disciples that were shaken in their boots freaked out by this manner of man who they now knew to be the resurrected Savior. Peter being one of them, all of them, ready to die for their faith, face death, and they did all but one, martyr's death, the gallows. God was with them even as Peter was crucified upside down in 64 AD. What was it? They were prepared as they witnessed the Savior responding to the gales of life, the ghouls of life. And they'd already seen him face the gallows. And they already knew the resurrected Savior. And they said, come. Ignatius of Antioch, a disciple of John, when faced with death in the arena at the hands of lions, said, let me be fodder for the wild beast in 107. This is how I may get to God, for I am but God's wheat being ground by the... I am God's wheat being ground by the teeth of the wild beast, that I may be the pure loaf of Christ. So, said Saint Ignatius, bring on the tearing of limbs. Bring on the crushing of bones, but bring me to Jesus. He is with you through the gale, in the midst of ghouls, and even as we might have to face gallows. Hallelujah. Amen.